points as we did in class, explain each important word briefly. Then, what is the character and nature of process of science? How does science get from an idea to a scientific law? Now, if you want to see this, you can just click on essays. And it is the first essay. But that's it. And it is directly from the lecture. Now, listen, don't write. Remember, who's the video, re I mean the audio recorder? Somebody's audio recording and dropping it in, right? Okay, good. So the audio recording will be there for you to hear this. Don't try to, one of the biggest mistakes you can make in taking classes is to try to write every word that some teacher says because you can never process it while you're writing it. And by the time you get the first sentence down, you don't remember the second one. So remember, listen, then write, or listen, then write as much as you can, but check the audio recording later. All right, so I'm going to tell you a very good um, essay for this portion. First of all, it says, what's the goal of a scientist? The goal of a scientist is to use a procedure that all people in science have agreed upon that is comparative, objective, measurable, able to assign a number to that everyone understands that is reliable and repeatable. To discover the procedures and methodology of how the universe works, has worked, and always will function, which is called a scientific law. And the universe is everything that is. But to pay for it in the United States, we must convince the public that we have really discovered something valuable by accurate prediction. That would be a perfect essay for the first what is the goal of a scientist. Notice I didn't say using the scientific method, I described it. You can say uses the scientific method, which is a procedure they all agreed on that is comparative, objective, uh, reliable, repeatable, and able to be assigned a number that everyone understands. Either way you want to, it's fine. Anyone not understand the definition? Okay, or, or how to write the essay. You can add more to that, you can subtract from it, uh, but those are the minimum things that must be in there. Then the definition of science, as we went over the other day, is the organized systematic study of the natural laws of the universe. And the only thing you can change about this is you can say science is a systematic organized study of the natural laws of the universe. You cannot say science is the love of Jesus and DNA and the way in which the periodic chart of the elements work together to give you atoms and molecules and the love of this universe we live in. That's called bullcrap. And not, it won't count off minus 50. I'll put out minus 60. <laughs> because that's not even close. That's crap you made up. So in this one case, I don't want you to change it to your own words. And I don't want you to make anything up or add to it. It took 1,100 years to get this. Yeah. So the essay is not like a five-paragraph essay. It's more like I'm just answering the questions. You can put it into three portions, because I'm going to ask. A, what's the goal of science? B, what's the definition of science? Explain each important word briefly. C, what is the um, nature, process, or character of science? And then you can answer each one. You can even use a colon and say, the definition of science as we studied is the system, organized systematic study of the natural laws of the universe, where the word organized means colon. Limit that everyone uses the same procedure and it has limits and rules, period. Where the word scientific means colon, using the scientific method, the word study means search for complete truth about something and you go on. Now, if I don't say explain the scientific method, please do not write on for four pages. <laughs> In the name of all that's holy, don't do that. You have no idea how I limit this to two pages. I have 125 students, and each one of them is going to write two pages 
in handwriting that is near chicken scratch. And I've got, I have learned to read almost every handwriting, but I have not learned to read box characters, acrylic characters, and, and phrases without subjects or verbs. <laughs> and so I cannot read, you remember you won't get credit for a sentence just because it starts with a capital and ends with a period. It's got to have something in there, especially a verb and a subject. It is a way, I have to prove that you can write a sentence and a paragraph that makes sense in English before they give you an AA from this college. They don't want you out there not knowing what a sentence is and waving around a certificate from Los Angeles City College. That's embarrassing. And by the way, we have some teachers here that can't write a sentence. Well, I know they've got their degree by driving through one of these college campuses and they threw it in the window and they threw out a check. Anyway. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. So for this one it can be one long sentence with a whole lot of colons. Yeah, well, not one long sentence. It, you need an introductory sentence. Then you need some supporting sentences like as we learned in science, 1100, over 1100 years we put together a standard definition. Period. Science is the organized systematic study of the natural laws of the universe. Period. I'm going to explain each important per word in this definition briefly. Period. The first word is the word organized. Colon. <clears throat> the second. And then you can go. Then you have to have a summary sentence. So using all of these words in the correct order, you will have a standard definition of science, which was, and you repeat yourself or something like that. Yeah. Ah! I know. I know there's some teachers that do that baby thing where you take it home and somebody else writes it and then you hand it in. <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. You're gonna have to bring it in here and write it here. All right. But if you have some little writing sample, not 14 pages, and you want me to look over a portion of it, you can email me and I will do my best to return comments on it. All right. So. And we remember that the word organized means that every, first and foremost, there are rules. And the first rule is that everyone uses the same methodology, procedure, or way to determine how the universe functions. Then the other part of the word organized is that there are other rules and there are limits to science. There are certain things that science cannot discuss. Name Three things. Religion. God. You can talk about religion if there's some measurements you can make about it, like how many commandments are there. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But you can't talk about God. Because is there a way to detect God? Measure God? No. Not yet. Remember, science changes. Eventually, someone might make a measurement. Right now, they can't. Love. Nobody can measure. There is no love meter. No, that's not what we're doing. Dirty, nasty mind. Okay, not any of that. Now, here's something. You remember the nature and character of science? The last part of the essay? That says that science is not history. It's not linear. It's in continuous revision, which ticks my mama off completely because she's always flipping on the radio and saying, Damn it, Don! Today, they said that uh, estrogen replacement therapy is... It's a very serious, unwise use of artificial estrogen for people in menopause. Now, just 10 years ago, they told me that this was a very good idea and it would help me through menopause. Now they're telling me it leads to breast cancer and other types of cancer and is a very bad idea. And if you use it at all, it should be for a very short-term use. Now, they lied to me. I said they did not. They made a better experiment they revise their conclusion. So let me give you an example of how life can change in science. And this one's really kind of personal because it happened here. Oh, a couple, many years ago, she's almost as old as I am now. A girl grew up in Glendale, a very rich girl by the way. Her family were doctors and her father was a doctor and her father's father was a doctor. 
Her whole family was doctors. And as she grew up, she knew she wanted to be an MD. And so her father took her to work a lot of times, and he worked at County USC Hospital. And as soon as she was able, she volunteered, and then as a candy striper, and then as a volunteer. And she went through college at USC, and she went to medical school. And then she became an oncologist at Norris Cancer Research Institute, which is one of the best in the world. And she wrote a lot of publications and developed therapies that are famous. And so she was elected the very first woman president of a major medical school in the United States. She became president of USC Medical School. And the entire time, she was preparing to be a doctor and practicing even, you know, doing her internship, she had a dirty little secret. Mm. Nasty little secret. She observed that patients that kept a positive attitude seemed to do better and last longer and survive even if they had terminal disease longer or get well quicker than those that gave up the moment they got a bad diagnosis. Now, I know that's true because I had a neighbor that I really liked and respected when I lived on the Long Creek before the Northridge earthquake knocked down our apartment building. Uh, wonderful guy, made lots of money, was an insurance adjuster, friendly, trustworthy, honest, just a good person, somebody you knew that you could go ask anything, they would tell you the truth. If you ask them to do a favor, they would do it if they could. And if they couldn't, they wouldn't lie to you and say, well, I'll try. It was just a fine, upstanding person. And he was gay, and he made a mistake. I guess he was drunk one night or something. Anyway, he got HIV. And the moment he got HIV, he went in his apartment, and he never came out. He started drinking. He quit his job. He didn't eat right. All he did was bitch and whine and complain, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I feel like hell, I know I can feel it. I know you're not supposed to be able to tell for 10 years, but I can t feel it crawling around in my body and all of this stuff. And he died within 24 months. Now you don't die for 15 or 20 years if you get HIV. But he gave up on life, never took medications drank all the time, ate poorly, and so it affected how the disease affected him. And I had that same belief that she did, and that is that hope is a scientific component of healing. And so when she gave her inaugural speech as after being elected, you know, and appointed or whatever, they, however they do it, president of the USC Medical School, her speech was, hope is a scientific component of healing. If she had not been so famous, and I'm sure while she was giving the speech, people went, are you crazy? You can't measure hope. We have no way of proving this. You may believe it, but it is not an a proper thing for scientists to say because they can't. It doesn't match the limits. And she said in her speech, oh yes it does. I did a scientific study. And she presented a study that has been replicated around the world and is now accepted that hope is a measurable scientific component of healing. Here's what she did. She took patients that were terminally ill, all having similar types of cancer and a prognosis of four years. Then she divided them into three groups and she got a grant to give them the best, most expensive medical treatment possible, no matter what the cost was, it was paid for. So everyone in the group got the best medical treatment available, no matter the cost. One third of the group was the control. They got the traditional doctor-patient relationship for the terminally ill. How do we treat the terminally ill if you're a doctor in the United States? Everything's going to be fine. Just trust me. You don't need to know all the details. 
just trust me. We'll do the best we can and everything will be fine. That's all they tell you. You're going to die in about four years, we think. But during that time, we're going to do move heaven and earth to save you. And no, we're not going to explain everything we're going to do. We're just going to do it. We have this deal with doctors. No other country has this. We'll pay them anything they ask. There is no amount of money that is too much. So long as they promise us, we'll be fine. We'll get well. And no, we don't want to know the details. So that's what the control group got. The next group, group two, got the very same doctor-patient relationship, but they got continuous positive psychotherapy and assistance. In other words, uh, they would go and say, what have you always dreamed that you wanted to do? Paint? We'll give you painting lessons. We're going to have you in group therapy where you keep a positive attitude. You're going to have um, you're going to have relaxation therapy. You're going to learn how to meditate. And every day of every minute of every day, we're going to try to maintain a positive attitude towards your illness and your circumstance. That was group two. Group three got the positive psychotherapy, meditation, and everything like that, relaxation therapy, but they also got complete control over their disease. The doctor would come in and say, I'm not deciding, you are. Here is your medical result. Here's your blood test. Here's what's out of line. This is the problem. These are the four therapies that have been used. These are the side effects of each one. These are the one, this is the one, that is the most successful, and this is the one I recommend. You think about it, and you decide where we go from here. Each step of the way, they had control over their Bless future. You. At Bless the you. end of the study, two groups live significantly longer by .0001 level of significance. The group that got the traditional relationship but positive thought, thought and meditation and the group that got traditional, uh, they got the unusual doctor relationship where they felt like they had some control over their future. Isn't hope where you feel like you have some way of affecting your future and you keep in a positive attitude? That's what she divided hope into. And now that's been replicated around the world. So something that was once thought not to be scientific, someone devised a way to make it measurable. So that's, remember, science can change. And remember that the, under the word organized, everybody agrees to the same methodology. Not, doesn't say what methodology it is, just says they all agree to one. And they agree that these are the limits and that it must be moral and responsible. And we talked about human subjects committees and everything last time. How it's now regulated. Yes? What was the third thing that was God, love, and... Oh, God, love, hatred, um, beauty. beauty. Measure beauty. Nobody can do it. I guess ugly, too. <laughs> I don't know. Every morning when I look in the mirror, I go, Damn, you're hot! I learned that from the Soviet Union. The more you tell a lie, the more it becomes the <laughs> truth. Okay, and remember that the scientific method is an orderly way of thinking. It's not a checklist. And who was the first guy to come up with the scientific method? Aristotle. Aristotle. And who was the first one to take measurements and separate religion from science as a study of the human condition? Copernicus. Remember, he Copern measured and found that it, with the telescope, that the earth did not, re the sun did not revolve around us, but we revolved around it. And of course he was excommunicated and burns in hell to this day. No, not really. About a hundred years ago they unexcommunicated him, so I guess he got out of hell. And we said that uh, when we, most scientists don't just look around under your armpit, they already have something they're interested in. And then what they do is they take papers that other people have written, they rip it to shreds, and then they look back at it and see if there's a way they can improve upon it, and they revise and do a better experiment. Okay? 
we stopped at the word steady, right? Yes or no? That's where I have in my notes we our last discussion. We're going over what does the word steady mean? Yeah. Okay. Then you state a positive statement about what you think is happening in the scientific method. And if you remember, I believe that caffeine causes students to do worse on exams. Yes. And then you can't prove a positive in science. People don't believe a positive. If you give them a list of things that prove something, a positive statement, they will say, I just not enough. I don't believe it. So you've got to convince the public. So we use a negative. We convert a hypothesis to a null. In my case, I believe that if you drink coffee, a lot of coffee uh, before an exam, you will do worse. That's my hypothesis. So what's my null? Caffeine has no effect on student test score. Then I can divide you into two groups. Give one group caffeine and one decaf and compare the average results, apply statistical methods, and see if there's a difference between the two groups. And remember, there are three levels of significance. Remember, what are, the, what are the two things required for someone to tell you a statistic and for you to believe it? They say, you know, 61% of all Californians believe that gay marriage is an okay thing, where only three years ago it was 47%. That was in the LA Times. Okay, now, how do you know to believe that? There are two things they must have. They got to have an N number. How many people did they ask? If they asked one, don't believe them. Yes. And what was the N number almost be usually minimum? 3,000 people. All right. And then they got to have a level of significance. In other words, how much can you trust their data? And the three levels are 0 0.1, 0 0.01, and 0 0.001. 0.1 is an estimate. It's within 10 to 30 percent wrong. If they tell you, oh, I'm confident to 0.1, it means they don't know crap. If they say, I'm confident I'm right to 0.01 level of significance, that means they could be wrong one out of a hundred times. Most experiments are that. And once in a lifetime, you find an experiment that has such a loud signal between the test group and the control group you could only be wrong one out of a thousand times. So remember, to believe a statistic, you must have one of these two levels of significance and you must have an N number. They just can't tell you 61% because you can prove that but and people will believe it, but it may not be correct. They could have, remember, we call statistics the mathematical science of lying. You can prove a lie. He's calling me. Stop it! You know I don't like that. I don't ever answer phone. All right. I like to get my texts. I like to send my email and check it out. I even like to look at the website on it, but I hate answering the thing. Remember that it, when you design an experiment, you can accidentally put errors in it. And what are errors called in a scientific experiment? Confounds. Confounds. And what was the first? confound ever discovered. <laughs> the placebo effect. Remember, I can convince myself of anything. And if you know you're in an experiment and you believe you're getting the miracle drug, you will improve because your mind can force your body to do things. Did you know that people with a positive attitude have a higher antibody count? Hmm. All right. And we talked about other confounds. If you're not doing boys versus girls, you can't get make one the control group and one the test group. You can't make color preference. You can't put caffeine in red cups and decaf in blue cups. You can't position cups in the room differently. All of those are errors that can mess up an experiment. How many confounds in an experiment make it garbage? One. one. So, the best way to control for an experimental error or confound is called randomization. Make sure you're only testing one thing at once. Assign everybody a number. Have a computer decide who gets in the test group and who gets the control group. And that way, if you do put 
a confound, you put it on both sides of the experiment, and you remember in mathematics, if it's on both sides of an equal sign, what happens? They, they cancel. cancel each other out. <coughs> All right. And remember that the tradition in this country is a double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. Who remembers what double-blind means? Not a, uh, you don't know which group you're in, and neither does the experimenter. And how do we control for the experimenter giving an unconscious cue in an experiment like <gasps> when you're about to sit down at a caffeine cup? I don't know which one is which. You don't know, but the man, the person running the experiment doesn't know, and we usually hire actors now to run experiments, and we film them, and everybody sees the same film on, you know, the introduction to the rules of the experiment. Um, and then we talked about there's another way besides double-blind, placebo-controlled trials. What's it called? For people that have cancer or terminally ill disease, they're not going to join a four-year trial. The with flip their side. Flip trial. And a flip trial is unlike the double-blind, placebo trial. Remember, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, you have a test group. It's usually 66% of the people are in and a control group that gets the faith. So 33% of the people in a six-year experiment get nothing. They get the placebo. But a flip trial, 66% go into the test group for the first three years, two years. Control about 33%. It can be two or three. And the control group gets the faith. 33%, but at year two, they switch sides. The control group is guaranteed to get the miracle drug. And so people that were terminally ill are guaranteed, if you join the study, and you're only prognosticated to live four years, you know that somewhere in the trial, you will get the new miracle drug that we think works. And this encourages people with terminally ill, like cancer and HIV, to be in an experiment where this one doesn't. Because if you're like me, you'll always believe you're in this one. I mean, you know, I bought a California lottery ticket every week since they began, and I have yet to win a dollar. <laughs> a dollar? So I know my luck if I have volunteered for a trial. I would be in this group. The one that got nothing that died for you. That's not positive. Not me. I know. That's, that's just the way I believe. And remember, what kinds of studies are there? How many? Four. Phase one, toxicity. Phase two, any effect. Phase three, three uh, must have 3,000, but they usually recruit 5,000. And if uh, there is at least 30% of the people get better, they establish dosage and activeness of it or whether or not it works and this is when you can allow, apply for permission from the FDA to prescribe it. When should After the long you take time. it? And that's right. This is called long term. When I go to the doctor and the doctor says, oh, you need a prescription for your blood pressure. I don't say, give me the latest thing. I say, give me something that's been out 10 years, that's been tried on 500,000 people. Because I don't want to be one of those people like Avandia, that everybody was on, and then all of a sudden, 10 years after millions of people were on it, they discovered you had an 11% increase in stroke and a 24% in heart attack in a long-term study. So this is where we should be asking our doctors for these drugs, not for the latest thing, unless, like you have Alzheimer's and there's no hope, you know, something like that. Okay, remember you can't do the experiment one, you got to repeat it many times, and remember to limit your conclusion. If you discover something, you can only say students taking microbiology in a spring term in an urban, suburb, urban Southern California microbiology class taught between 8 and 11, 10 on Mondays and Wednesdays, I found blah. <clears throat> and then it's up to other people who read your paper to generalize.